Oh, there was one more slide. So there's a, anyway, we'll talk about the timer that you can see. It's okay. There was a slide, and at the end it said, thank you to everyone who serves and all that you do, even if the pastor gets on to you for stopping the video early. Uh, no, we love you, and we appreciate it. <laughs> She's like, I'm doing this for Jesus now, for sure. But um, anyway, I really do appreciate everybody who serves. Today we're going to talk about lost and found, and we are in Luke chapter 16 today, and some very familiar stories to you. The story of the prodigal son is there. And um, the kids are already excited about it. I can hear them. So um, years ago, maybe you didn't know this. Uh, um, by the way, we're going to talk about why does God love the lost? Why does God love the lost? Why does... There we go. Does God love the lost? Okay. So, so here's the thing about why God loves the lost. <laughs> I got her all rattled now. She's never going to talk to me again. It's all right. So years ago, you may not know this, but Billy Graham was not a Christian his whole life. And so I don't know if he was in junior or high school. I meant to look that up last night, but he was in junior high or high school. And his friend invited him to a revival meeting with a guy named Mordecai Ham. You've never heard of him. But um, at that meeting, he came in and he and his friend came in and there were no seats. So he was going to leave. And a, a person who was ushering basically said, I've got a seat for you, and carried, or well, took Billy Graham and his friend up front and sat them where they could be part of the revival. And, and then at the end of that revival night, Billy Graham gave, came forward and gave his life to Christ. And I've always, number one, we have no idea who that person is. Number two, I have, I've been a pastor long enough to know that that usher had a bad day that day. That usher said, there is no way I'm going tonight. I split my pants. I spilled my coffee. I had a bad day. I just, here's why. Because anytime you're doing something for Christ, you think, and the enemy will think of an excuse for you not to do anything. And the truth is, I talked, and this was amazing. Last night I talked about how Rodney, who pastors now uh, over at another church, was saved at a Billy Graham conference. And then last night, the person who leads our ushers came up to me and said, did you know I was saved at a Billy Graham conference? And I said, no. It's amazing that now she's doing the very thing that helped Billy Graham to come to Christ. And I say all that to say this. Love is about sacrifice. And when you sacrifice to serve others for Christ... When you go out of your way, whatever, even if it seems like a small gift, even if it seems like it's not a big deal, even if it seems like, well, I'm just greeting people, I'm just making coffee, I'm just helping somebody find a seat, I'm just singing on Sunday morning. By the way, huge praise team this morning, all these singers I love. And we got some guys up here. I don't know what to do with guys. I can, I feel, I'm like, am I on the mic? Oh, wait, no, it's not me. It's guys. So, um... Here's what I want you to know. Why does God love the lost? And today I want to encourage you, if you don't hear anything else, hear this. I want you to go out of your way to sacrifice, whatever that means for you, to help others find their way home. And we're going to talk a little bit later about because three dots are coming. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. I sent my wife the most weird text this week, and I'm talking about that near the end. All right, here we go. Number one, God rejoices over repentance. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 16. We'll start in verse 1. We'll be skipping a little bit, but hopefully you'll catch up. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. And I love, by the way, tax collectors and sinners, the reason they did that is you think sinners were bad. Tax collectors were worse. Uh, kind of like... Um, calling your insurance company today. Anyway, uh, maybe politicians. Okay, so the tax collectors and sinners were gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Sorry, I've been reading my grandbaby book, so now I'm doing voices. <laughs> then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Once again, that's sacrifice, right? 
Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there would be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. By the way, every once in a while somebody reads this story and goes, Well, Jesus hung out with sinners, so that means I can go to a bar and get drunk with my friends. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what it's... What is, it, what is he celebrating? The fact that they repented from sin. And then he tells a story about a woman who has a coin and loses the coin. And, and some scholars think that this was actually a wedding necklace. And on a wedding necklace during that time, it would have 10 coins. And so if you lost one, you had lost. It was like losing your wedding ring. And so she's searching the house for the wedding ring. She's searching the house for the coin. She finds it, and she begins to tell her neighbors and celebrate. And then it says this, In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And I love that it's in the presence of angels. So who does that mean is celebrating? The saints, those who've gone before us, and Jesus is celebrating what? That we came to Christ, that we repented. And so I want to challenge you to do something today because here's the thing. We tend to think, well, I'm just... Whatever. Because the enemy wants you to think that you have no gifts, you have nothing to give, you're not a good example, and maybe you're not. Maybe you're not, but that's not the point. I, there's one guy who comes to our church, I tell him all the time, he's our non-example. His name's Paul. You get to meet him. I, I love Paul, but I tell Paul all the time, I'm like, we have to have people who are non-examples. And here's the truth. I want to encourage you to go out of your way to thank God for wanting to know you. Because the truth is, he wants to know you. And so when you recognize that even if you've wandered off, even if you're struggling in certain places in your life, that the God of the universe wants to know you. So sometimes, just take a moment to say, God, thank you that you want to know me. You know, maybe in your life you had a family that didn't want you. Maybe in your life you had a family that if you went missing, they wouldn't come looking for you. I'm not going to tell that story told my mom I wouldn't tell that one. All right, number two, God longs for us. Uh, she's watching this morning, by the way. God longs for you, for us to come home. God longs for us to come home. And let me tell you about something about coming home. When you read this story of the prodigal son, what's interesting about it is the brother is mad about it. And you know why? Because the brother thinks the house is about him. And one of the things that I teach in the new members class, and I have to say to people over and over, and by the way, I have to repeat to myself once in a while, is this is not a country club church. A country club church says, I prefer this to that. And they come, and they're like Simon Cowell. They come to church and go, I give today's sermon a four. You know the music would be better if they did the music that I like. I left a dying church that did that kind of music, and now I want that dying music here. Right? And, and we tend to want to be a country club. Oh, it's about me. It's about me. And when you find yourself saying, me, 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 and when a church begins to say, me, 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 God says, you know what? Why don't you have church on your own? And the truth is, what happened? The brother comes home and says, why don't I get that? Why don't I get that? It's about me. It's about me. And Jesus is like, hey, this story is not about you. Listen to what the story is really about. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. By the way, this is like the younger brother saying, would you die? Not really nice. And the thing is, the older brother had more of a right. He didn't really have a right, but it says, so he divided his property between them. Why? Because the dad loved his son. And of course, we know the rest of the story. The brother goes out. He lives wild living, spends all his money, is feeding the hogs, which for a Jew was awful, right? And he's starting to desire the slop, and slop smells awful, just so you know. And he's desiring that, and finally he says, it's time for me to go home. And it says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. What's he doing? He's coming back, and he doesn't have demands. He's not saying, God, I'll come to you if you'll let me do this. 
If you'll let me keep this aspect of my life. No, he says, hey, just make me one of your, whatever you need to do, I'm coming home. And then it continues. So he got up and went to his father and listened to this. This was a surprise to anybody listening to this story. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with, listen, compassion for him. So if you're far from God today, can I tell you that when he sees you and when you're ready to come home, he is filled not with hate, not with anger, not with vengeance. He's filled with compassion for you. And then it continues. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son starts his speech. It says, the son said to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And he's getting ready to continue the speech. But the father, he interrupts him and says to his, his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. What was he doing? He's walking him home. He's saying, you're still a part of the, the family. You're no longer a servant. Servants go barefoot, but you have sandals. And then he continues, bring the fattened calf and kill it. So it's more than he even deserved, which is how good God is to us. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Why? For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And this week, as we celebrate all of those who serve and go out of their way, I cannot thank you enough. We have tons of ministries that go on here, but I know so many of you do so many things outside of what we do officially here as a church. It's amazing to me, but let me just read a few of the things that we do, because I think a lot of times people don't know all the things we do. So I'm going to just read some names for you. First of all, our financial staff is Mike Williams. Steve and Patty is our associate pastor. Rodney and Kirsten. Rodney, who was up here, you know what he does. He's another one of our staff members. Denise and Chad, who's over here, leads our worship uh, Diane Green, who, if I started to list all the things she does, it would, we would have the sermon go over time, and you would hate me, because she does so much. Um, we, we will give her whatever title she wants, and next year we're going to make her work more for us. So that's just part of the deal. <laughs> Danielle and Joe are doing our kids and our youth. If you haven't seen what's going on, listen, a growing church has more and more kids, and that makes us old people more and more uncomfortable. And that's good. Because when you're uncomfortable, I don't like the noise. I don't like the mmm. I don't like the mmm. And Jesus said, let the children come to me. Jesus might as well have just said, let them scream. Uh, you know, because such is the kingdom of heaven. And so we go out of our way and we look and we say, I'm, gonna, I'm willing to sacrifice my comfort. I'm willing to sacrifice my preferences for what? To help other people find their way home to Christ. And then uh, we have Nikki, who's helping with the kids now. Uh, you know, uh, I think I already talked about Steve and Patty, who do all kinds of things. Men's Breakfast is led by Bum, uh, Mark Bumgarner. Ladies' Lunch by Beth Warner. That's, I love that we're having these breakfasts and these lunches where people are getting together and getting to know each other. Some of the Saturday people even know some of the Sunday people now. It's pandemonium at those meetings. Surf Awakening, that's awesome. Keith and Beth are doing that. Uh, the Sharing Center, Patty does collections. Of course, Diane's part of that too. The Blood Mobile, uh, Denise and Bruce Ravel, Rick Zubowitz helps with that. Caring cards to senior homes. Jane McGrady does that, and that is a great ministry. Uh, Peggy does the mission trip in country. Becky Carmichael, of course, we talked about doing Advent. We have a guy who doesn't even go here to church because he lives in Virginia who does our podcast every week. I think he lives in Virginia. Maybe it's Tennessee. Somewhere cold and nice. I don't know. That's Bob Urey. Bob and Mary where? I told Mary, I don't even have a picture of you, Mary. She said, that's good. And they do all of our greeters and ushers on Sunday morning and do such a great job. Operation, uh, And then Saturday night, of course, we have uh, uh, Mary Ann Alderman, who does all our ushers and deacons then. She's the one who talked to me. Uh, uh, Operation Christmas Child, Diana Knapp, Diana Archibald, uh, Suzanne Robinson runs our announcement Sunday and gets all kind of people involved. Gary McNutt does our kitchen hospitality. Amy Sue Lovis does our presentation. And the man who makes sure you can hear us anywhere in the world, Randy Spolster, who's here this morning, he does a little bit of everything. And so, Randy, all the IT, light, sound, everything, that's the man right there that we harass continually. So... And can I tell you a secret? That's just the teams I know about. There's people doing stuff. Somebody's going to come up to me later this afternoon and go, you forgot, because that's how it is. Now, I will tell you that what happens over and over again is a team thinks, well, we're the most important team, and they are. 
but we also make room for other teams. And so we always go out of our way to say, what does God want us to do inside of what our purpose is? And by the way, with all these teams, we still say no to some things. Did you know that? With all these things happening, we still have to say sometimes, you know what, I think so-and-so down the road actually does that better. And I had, a guy, I had a guy come to me last week and say, you know, you should do this. And I go, you know, that church down the road is doing that. You maybe should go there. And he didn't like my answer, but that's normal for me. So help others find their way home. That's the whole point. What, why do we do all this to help others find their way home? And here's the thing. It doesn't mean much to you until you think of somebody you know that's far from Christ. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's one of your relatives. Maybe it's somebody who hasn't been to church in years and you're praying that somebody will greet them and be nice to them because the last church they went to, they were mean. Or the last church they went to, they sat down and somebody came up to them and said, you're in my seat. By the way, if that ever happens here, I will find you. (laughs) What's it that the guy says? I have a special set of skills, right? Because we love people, and I want your relatives to come, and I don't want what happened to my grandfather when he showed up for church, when my mom finally got him to come, where a family sat behind him the whole time and said, you're in our seats the whole service. And my grandfather didn't come to Christ at that time because there was somebody mad about his seating chart. Our goal is to help people find their way home, so we have to give up our preferences. We have to give up what we think is the most important. Why? What's the most important? The people. We want to see people come to Christ and grow in Him. Number three, the focus is on eternity. I texted Kristen yesterday, and everybody talks about the dash on the tombstone, right? You've all heard that. There's a poem called The Dash, and it's important how you live the dash, and it is. But I want you to live the dash In light of, Mike, you're going to love this, the ellipse. The three dots at the end. I told Kristen, I want three dots on my tombstone. She's like, what in the world are you talking about? I said, I want it to say, Eric Brookins, 1968 to 2068. Boy, I hope so. (laughs) But then I want it to be dot, dot, dot. Because you know what that means? To be continued. It's not the end of the story. The day that I'm in the grave is not the end. And yes, I want to do what's in the dash right now to make a difference. But why? Because I want other people to have three dots on their tombstone. I want them to have eternity in heaven to know Jesus. Listen to the story Jesus tells, and it's the story of Lazarus. Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he's comforted here, and you're in agony. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been set in place. So that those who want to go from here to you can't, and anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus. This is the poor man. This is the rich man talking to God saying, hey, send Lazarus to talk to them, to my family. For I have five brothers. Let him warn them so they will not also come to this place of torment. What's he doing? Well, I wish during the dash I had thought about eternity. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they'll repent. Abraham said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. By the way, Jesus is talking about himself. He's saying, if they don't even listen now, when they've been told all these things, they're not going to listen, even if you give them every proof they can have. Jesus understood that what we do during the dash makes a difference in eternity. And so I want to encourage you to make life choices in light of eternity. I love Celebration Weekend. And the reason I love Celebration Weekend is A lot of you have no idea all the things that happen. You know one or two things at our church. You hear the announcements every week. Sometimes you don't listen to the announcements every week. And I know that because you come to me later and go, when did we do a sign up? And I go, my secretary's wearing a shirt that says it was in the bulletin. But the truth is, there's tons of stuff that goes on, not just inside the church, not just somebody greeting you, not just somebody giving you coffee, not just somebody giving you a donut, not just somebody inviting your friends and making them feel welcome. You guys go out of your way to bless your neighbors, to bless your family, 
to bless your friends because you know that this is not all there is. And so today we celebrate and we thank God for all that God has done this year and is going to continue to do. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to live your life in the light of eternity and know that choices that you make today affect you in eternity. And if you're ready to surrender your life to Christ, you've had enough of living on your own, I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to surrender your life to Christ. So right after the service, just come up to me. Come up to me. Uh, uh, somebody might grab me, but you, you get in line, whatever, and, and say, I'm ready to give my life to Christ, and I'd love to pray with you today. Maybe you're here today, and the truth is you've been distracted by other things. Maybe like me, you get to be Simon Cowell once in a while. I just wish life was a little different. And I want to encourage you. It's time to let that go and say, God, instead of my preferences, I want to do what you've called me to do. So would you give me your desires? Would you help me to help others find their way home? Let's close in prayer. Would you join me? Father, thank you for this time today. Lord, I am so grateful for all those who serve and give. Lord, all these hundreds of boxes that are up here going around the world are just a symbol of what you're doing, not just in our church, but in our community. Help us to continue to be a light in this dark world. Father, for those who are under attack because they're doing something that matters, I want to pray today that you would give them the courage, the strength that they need. Father, for those who are being uh, uh, tormented by uh, thoughts of uh, sadness and anger, Lord, would you give them your grace today so that they could be a light in this dark world, truth and light. That's what we want. Lord, help us to never be a country club. Help us to never be uh, uh, selfish and self-centered, but instead to be a life-saving station for you. We trust you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.